Well, on Outsiders, we bring you the voices you do not get to hear in the mainstream media. Today, we are speaking to one of the most polarising and well-known commentators in the UK, a media personality, columnist and businesswoman once described as the most hated woman in Britain, a household name in Britain who began her media career on The Apprentice and went on to become a much-loved, hated and feared columnist with several British newspapers before hosting her own TV show and her own radio show. A musical has been written about her assassination. A true pommy outsider, our guest is a massive Trump fan, she was also a fierce supporter of Brexit, a critic of uncontrolled immigration in Europe and is a constant irritant to the woke, open borders, climate lovies of Britain and around the world. She has been accused by her many critics of racism, of fat shaming, of Islamophobia, being anti-feminist and so on. By inviting her on our show, I point out the three of us do not necessarily support or share her views, but we are interested in her work and her popularity with over a million followers on Twitter. Is she a bigoted, misogynist, racist, homophobe? Or is she a voice of common sense? You decide for yourself. One thing for sure, she's entertaining. Welcome to Outsiders, Katie Hopkins. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me on. And I should point out, uh, it doesn't matter to me whether people think I'm a jolly good laugh or whether they think I'm a racist, bigoted, Islamophobic, fat-shaming fool because ultimately <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's not other people's opinion that matters. I have my views. These are my own views. I'm proud of them and they're my authentic views. I am a straight, white, Christian conservative, married, surprisingly, mother of three children. And I'm proud to be all of those things. And where I come from here in the UK, I am right up there with the endangered species. I'm right up there with the black <laughs> rhino. But he has an advantage because he is a minority. So that's where I come from. And frankly, I'm not bothered about other people's opinions on me. Katie, what does it feel like to have a musical funded by the taxpayer that's called The Assassination of Katie Hopkins, playing in the West End. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting one. So because of my views, because I'm outspoken about the fact that my country is being taken over, that by 2035, just 15 years' time, uh, Muslims will outnumber births to any other religion and or none. So we are being outnumbered here. Because I'm outspoken about these obvious facts that are a cause for concern, uh, I was the target of a jihadi plot to behead me and the British government weren't satisfied uh, with that plot to behead me so they came out and funded a play called The Assassination of Katie Hopkins and they put up billboards around the country promoting that as well. And that's just bearing in mind that I am not, I've never been uh, convicted of a hate crime, I have never ever been, I don't have any criminal records, all I am is a mother of three kids who's worried about my country. I went through Sandhurst. I am uh, a member of the British forces. I was supposed to serve a 35-year regular commission. All I'm doing is fighting for my country. And of course, that's something the woke brigade just cannot stand. Of course they can't. Um, now let's just discuss, uh, we're going to talk about South Africa in a second because you've made a documentary called The Killing Fields. But first up, I just want your thoughts uh, on this uh, happy morning. Boris is going to have another baby. <laughs> Yay! Hooray, hooray, hooray. So I should say, I love Boris Johnson. I think he's fantastic. He's exuberant. He's brilliantly clever. He can uh, recite Homer's Odyssey from memory. He speaks fluent Greek, sp fluent Latin. So another Boris Johnson on this planet is going to be a terrific thing. Boris and Trump together is just what a moment to be alive. I couldn't be happier with Boris and, and Trump together. It's like having Reagan and Thatcher back <laughs> if both their hairdressers had special educational needs. Um, but Boris Johnson, we have a, a beautiful MP in the UK. You probably know of him called Jacob Rees-Mogg. Yes. yes. Probably the poshest man yeah, in the whole of the UK. He called his sixth child Sixtus. S-E-X-T-U-S, Sixtus. So we're wondering what Boris is going to call his baby, but no one really knows how many babies exactly. Boris Johnson's had, so that may be a challenge. He's a very fertile individual, very, very fertile individual. Oh, goodness. And, you know, I, think, I, think that, 
I think that best represents the average British male, actually. <laughs> the best of British are very fertile gentlemen and, uh, you know, the very best of us. Rita. Oh, goodness me. I don't know if I want to picture that, but <laughs> Boris being fertile. But I want to just ask you, you made that comparison between Thatcher and uh, Reagan and now with Trump and, and Johnson, but is he worthy of being compared to Thatcher? He's... Uh, I've always seen him as wishy-washy, and I just want to ask you about signing up to this 2050 net zero emissions, and we've now just had the Heathrow decision. Uh. The third runway is out because it's not going to help you meet your climate targets. So how is he going to handle this going forward? Oh, this, it's just the dullness, isn't it, of the whole green mafia that we have to endure <laughs> constantly. I'm just sick to death of all of them. We've just had the little Greta Thunberg in Bristol, a little city we have here in the England, and, uh, you know, 35,000 school kids brought together, all of them bunking off school. They're supposed to be in school. Normally, parents like me are fined if our children don't go to school, but it's OK if they're all turning up to watch this little kid in a raincoat tell us that the world is on fire. Well, funnily <laughs> enough, when you're standing in the pouring rain in Bristol with 35 other posh school kids, the world really isn't on fire. They were in a mud bath. No, Greta, the world's not on fire. It's just constantly raining, love. It's constantly raining. <laughs> and the other thing about Greta Thunberg is all of these posh shows, and it's always the posh show kids. It's always the ones who've got all the cash. They've only just got back from their skiing trips. It's why half of them have got the coronavirus in the first place is because they just came back from northern Italy. So they're stood there with their coronavirus, 35,000 of them all together. I mean, hopefully many more will come down with the damn thing before oh, the day's over. Oh, 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 come on. Oh, calm yourself. Calm yourselves. It's all right. You're inoculated. You've already said you don't agree with anything I say. And actually, I want to call you guys out on this as well. You, particularly Rowan, yes. you sit there and you say, blah, blah, blah defend freedom of speech but I don't agree with anything that was said and it's one of the most <laughs> annoying things that you can do is it try is. and this inoculate yourself by saying I don't agree with this you guys wouldn't defend freedom of speech because you don't have it in Australia anymore we don't have it here in the UK anymore either and you've no point quoting Voltaire like you came up with something <laughs> clever because frankly no one would defend freedom of speech to their death because we don't have it anymore good Australians that I know and I love they self-censor everywhere they go because they can no longer speak about how they think or how they feel. And it's the mechanism of control and it's why your neighbours in New Zealand are ripe for being taken over by the religion of peace because they're already on bended knee. And Australia can't afford for that to happen. So I think you need to stop caveating <laughs> your guests and your comments with, I don't believe in anything they said or I don't defend it. I think you need to be a bit more robust in that's, what you're doing. That's very good criticism, very valid criticism. And you're absolutely right, Katie, that in Australia, free speech over the last couple of years has gone out the window. It is gone. And uh, we've gone. seen some, some terrible examples of that, and we see them all the time. Um, I want to ask you uh, about South Africa, your work with uh, the, yes. the Killing Fields. Tell us about the documentary and how you came to do that. Well, um, I've always been someone, so I consider it my job to tell the things not being told. I consider it my job to be out there on the pavements, on the sidewalks, finding the stories and telling the truth. So I think too many boys spend too much time sitting in studios behind bright lights and not enough of them spend time going out to see what they're actually talking about. Uh, I've travelled with migrants across the Med. I've slept on Skid Row in L.A., um, and with the killing of the white farmers in South Africa, I went uh, to the farms in South Africa. I slept on white farms with farmers, with victims, uh, with widows who have lost their husbands to better understand the genocide of the whites that I uh, am very clear is happening. Uh, whites are being killed in South Africa at a rate five times that which is normal, the murder rate in South Africa, three times the rate of the South African police service. And when people say, well, this is just typical, it's a very dangerous country. Well, yes, it is. But if you look at the way that these white farmers are hunted down, they are then tortured in their homes for hours upon end with blow torches, with hot irons. They are strung up with wire. Really, really 
devastating and it, and it breaks my heart that Australia has gone back on its offer uh, to give refugee status to South Africans uh, truly at the moment. I think it's just today actually in your country you're saying they don't deserve refugee status and what I would say to anybody who has something to say about South Africa is why don't you go? Why don't you go and sleep on the white farms at night because at night is when the monsters come and they don't stop at anything. They are out to kill the boar. They have a song called Kill the Boar. It is a politicized genocide of the white farmer. They're down to about 4% now, and within my lifetime and yours, there will be no white farmers left in South Africa. But because they are the wrong color, the world is prepared to look the other way. And Australia has just decided to do the same. And the more that I can help people understand what's going on the ground, uh, please do have a look at my documentary, Killing Fields. I speak to one of the farm murderers who talks about why they rape three and four year olds, the children of the farmers. Uh, it's a powerful documentary. It also involves members of the South African Police Service who know that they are also complicit in the genocide of the whites. It's the weapons of the police service being used against the white farmers. So time is running out for the white farmer. I guess the question is now that Australia has turned its back on them, who will they go to next? Where do they run to? Uh, because you're, you're, they are you're poor absolute, people, they have nowhere to go. You're absolutely right, Katie. It is shameful that what our government has done. Peter Dutton, the Home Affairs Minister, was all for at one stage uh, yeah. allowing South African farmers in. We on this show have repeatedly argued for that, uh, putting out the red carpet because we can't think of anyone better to bring into the country, particularly a con uh, Yes, Paul, Paul Tui did a really excel excellent report for News Corp going yes. to South Africa. Yeah. Uh, talking to, to the farmers, talking to, just exploring exactly what's happening there. And uh, the stories are harrowing, just absolutely horrific accounts of violence and, and intimidation. And what is clear, Katie, is that the bureaucrats, of our left-wing bureaucrats in Canberra, have got in and pulled the rug on this. You're absolutely right that it's disgraceful. James? Oh, I was just going to ask, I mean, just to follow up on this, we have seen some good reporting on this, but not enough. I want to know, is South Africa going down the same road as Zimbabwe? Have we? Yes, absolutely. So Zimbabwe was the breadbasket of South <clears throat> Africa uh, because the white farmers were culled from the land there. It is now in absolute famine. They're going to be requiring food aid and are requiring it. South Africa is following directly behind that. So the more that you chase whites off the land, you can't just put respectfully a black individual onto that farm. They don't just become a farmer. And very often these farms are just looted. Everything is stripped from that farm. It's no longer a viable farm. Those white farmers are needed in order to feed South Africa. But, uh, but you know what's going to happen? They're going to hit famine. And when they hit famine, they're going to blame it on climate change. And then yes. they're going to say that we need aid from Britain, from Australia, from other countries, people like me who've been warning about this. And for my troubles, may I just say, uh, I have been, I was detained when I tried to leave the country because they didn't want me reporting on this. And I have been banned from South Africa for spreading racial hatred. That's the definition of the ANC for talking about white farmers in South Africa. Um, so I have paid a personal price uh, for that, as I have with much of my speaking out. Uh, but I'm still determined to fight the good fight for these farmers. And if you listen to their stories now, they are planning. Each weekend they meet up and they're planning to make a last stand, a final retreat to defendable space where they will make a last stand for their country. This truly is biblical and epic in proportion. And actually, it is a, a look forward. It is a glimpse into the future of Great Britain, because in Great Britain right now, people are working out where they are going to go. Where will they leave when our country is finally taken over? Um, you know, this stuff is big stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And Katie, you urge people to watch your documentary. Now, I want to go back to, you've rightly said that you have suffered enormously for speaking out, for speaking uh, your truth, and you've lost your house, you've been cancelled. This is the thing that the left are now doing, this cancel culture. You've been off Twitter, on Twitter, on in this magazine, off that radio station. Tell us what it's like to be persecuted in this way. <laughs> well, I first up, 
um, I accept everything that comes my way. So I put myself out here. I have to suck it up. If I don't like it, then I can go home. I can sit on my sofa and I can be quiet. So tough, 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 toughness for me. You know, I've just got to suck this up. But as a result of speaking out about the truths of my country, uh, I have been arrested and interviewed under caution because of a column in a newspaper. I have been arrested and challenged because I made the point that uh, pa Pakistani grooming gangs are made up of majority Pakistani Muslim men. I was arrested for that. Um, I have lost every job I ever had. I was a columnist, successful columnist, most read columnist uh, at Men Online for two years, lost that job, lost my radio show. And then they came for my house. Uh, they made a new law just for me. Um, how lucky I am that said uh, you can be, I can cause you serious harm if you perceive that I have caused you serious harm oh and you don't God. need to prove it. And to isolate myself from all of the attacks, I have sold everything. I own nothing um, and I have nothing. And, and that in a way has been very freeing. In order for me to obtain my freedom of speech, I have given up everything. Um, and that's a, a very willing, that's, that's a sacrifice I've been very willing to make because I'm so proud and pleased and delighted to have such strong supporters and followers and I really thank the people that keep me going uh, because they really matter they are the light that guides the way and I think uh, people like me are needed because the more of us that have the moral courage to stand up and speak the truth of our countries uh, it helps to just push back the walls for a little bit longer and make other people feel that they're not alone because the truth of your audience is that it is lonely. People are lonely out there because they feel that no one else shares their opinion or they can't get to people that feel the same way. And I think these days, at these times, people are lonelier than they've ever been in their lifetime or at any time in history. And I'm here really to tell people you're not alone. There's many of us. We're a silent army, but we're a strong one. And anytime you need me, I'm right here for you at KT Hopkins, capital K, capital T Hopkins. Katie Hopkins, thanks so much for coming on today. Absolute privilege and pleasure to have you on. You will have given a lot of people a lot to think about. And I hope we see you again and uh, keep up a great Thank fight. You very much. So many people are supporting you and behind you. Thank you, Katie Hopkins. Thank you. There you go. Scared of the coronavirus? Wait till you hear what our epidemiologist has to say, say about life in the hot zone. And James Donkey Vote back in a tick. Now, Bernie Sanders is facing a good amount of backlash for praising Fidel Castro's communist reign over Cuba, which frankly is awfully unfair if you ask me. After all, it seemed to work out for everybody. You know, if you ignore the poverty, starvation, economic despair, and oppression. Because what's a little malnutrition when you've got the government cheese, right? Just not actual cheese because nobody could afford that. Now, this is not a big secret. In fact, it's pretty much available to anyone with access to a keyboard and Wi-Fi, so not Cubans. Castro's five-decade reign in Cuba left the country in shambles. What started out as a revolution that promised to lift Cubans out of poverty at the expense of the ultra-wealthy, sound at all familiar? It ended up wrecking a nation for generations. Castro seized land for redistribution and limited how much you could own. His socialist policies like free education, wage limits, rent control, and health care for all bankrupted the entire country. When the Soviet Union collapsed because its own socialist model went belly up and Cuba lost those subsidies and trade agreements, malnutrition triggered an outbreak of disease so bad that the state's free health care system could not keep up. Cubans were forced to buy rationed food with government food cards. Things like dairy products and meat were too expensive for most people to buy on the regular. The state did provide free education, of course, but a great pile of help that is when you graduate and you can't find a job because your country's entire economy is in the toilet. In the 1990s, the housing deficit in Havana grew by 20% a year. Nearly half of all the houses would be considered structurally uninhabitable. Most haven't seen any considerable amount of upkeep since the 1950s. Didn't like it? Couldn't say so. 
Anybody who spoke out against the government were thrown into horrific prisons that most people wouldn't let their dogs walk through. Thousands of political dissidents were harassed and tortured. Basic human rights and political freedoms were outright denied. Things were so bad under Castro that people were loading their kids, babies, and all of their handful of earthly possessions onto pool noodles and garbage can lids trying to float to Florida to get away from it. You know, you don't do that if your country's utopian dream is working out so well. Now, Sanders says this. We're very opposed to the authoritarian nature of Cuba. But, you know, you got, it's unfair to simply say everything is bad. You know, when Fidel Castro came into office, you know what he did? He had a massive literacy program. Is that a bad thing? Even though Fidel Castro did it? There's a lot of dissidents imprisoned in, in Cuba. That's right. And we condemn that. He likes to point to the country's literacy program as some kind of bright spot in the midst of an otherwise steaming pile of dog crap, because apparently if you throw enough glitter on a turd, it magically turns into a cupcake. You know what their literacy program was? It was force-feeding people communist propaganda at the point of a government gun. So hey, you know, sorry about your lack of basic freedom and, you know, food, but at least you can read about your own oppression in a book, right? Great. See, this is socialism. This is communism. It's one and the same. Guess how we know? Because Karl Marx said so. There is no utopia. There's no final destination where everyone is free and healthy and happy and dancing through the fields chasing butterflies. There is no socialist paradise that we just haven't discovered because no one's done it right yet. Castro was not a bad example of far-left policies. He was a perfect example of them. They worked exactly as they were designed to. Everyone was made equal, equally poor, while the state enjoyed all the amenities of government that didn't have to worry about ever being challenged by the unarmed, starving peasants. And that is exactly what the left will do here. We're not immune to this just because we're America. We can go down with the ship just as easily as any other nation that has ever ushered in these terrible, awful, no good, very bad policies that have never worked in the history of mankind. All of the medical innovations made possible by a free market, all that technology, all the means of production, all gone. The agricultural advancements that have fed billions, the biomedical engineering that has cured diseases and given us vaccines and prosthetics, gone, all gone. You will own nothing, not even yourself. This is not a secret. It's right there in the history books over and over and over again. Cuba, Venezuela, the USSR, all lying in ruin thanks to revolutions that promise to solve everyone's problems if you will just surrender your freedom and any sense of personal responsibility to the state. And I don't know about you, but I would rather sweat every single day for the little that I do have then wind up face first in the dirt, licking the boots of a government that promised to save me and trampled on me instead. And that's your Reality Check America. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube page that you like us on Facebook and Twitter. And stay sane out there. I was recently invited to speak at one of Candace Owens' Blexus events. This one was in Charlotte, North Carolina. Enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage author and radio host, Larry Elder. Thank you so much. Wow. Didn't expect that. <laughs> My goodness. Now, if you don't follow me on Twitter and Instagram after all of that, that's on you. Thank you so much for having me. Candace has invited me to several of these events. I really do appreciate it. Let me give you the quick Cliff Notes version of how I got into talk radio. I was living in Cleveland. I'm from LA, but I was living in Cleveland. And I wrote an op-ed piece for the newspaper, this is about 30 years ago, and I argued that racism was no longer a significant enough problem to hold anybody back if they're willing to work hard. I get a phone call from a producer of a radio show. He said, are you black? I said, I think so. He said, will you go on my guy's show and talk about this? You really believe that racism is not a big problem anymore? I said, I didn't say it didn't exist. I said it no longer can hold you back if you're willing to work hard, you stay focused, and don't make bad moral mistakes. So I'm on this guy's show for an hour. Now, Cleveland is about 50% black, so virtually all the callers were black. 
I was called in an hour an Uncle Tom, a bootlicking Uncle Tom, a foot shuffling bootlicking Uncle Tom, a bug eyed foot shuffling bootlicking Uncle Tom, an Oreo, uh, as in brown on the outside, white on the inside, coconut, the same concept, the Antichrist, and then I was called that word that you call a black person when you really, really want to hurt him. I was called Republican. A man can only take so much. But you know what I wasn't called? I wasn't called wrong. I said the number one problem in this country in general, and the black community in particular, is the fact that 70% of black kids are now born into this world without a father in the home. 70%. And forget about Larry Elder. Obama once said, a kid raised without a father is five times more likely to be poor, nine times more likely to drop out of school, 20 times more likely to end up in jail. It is far and away the number one problem facing this country. Now, what's happened? People like Walter Williams, the extraordinary economist, says in 1940, only 12% of black kids were born outside of wedlock. There's some census data that suggests 1900, 1890, a black child was slightly more likely to be born to mother and father married than a white kid. Then comes the war on poverty. 1965, Lyndon Johnson argued that black people need to have assistance. Sent out a bunch of, uh, of social workers, literally knocking on doors, apprising women of the availability of money, providing there was no man in the house. We've gone from 25% black kids born outside of wedlock in 1965 to 70% now. What the welfare state has done is it incentivized women to marry the government and allowed men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility. And that's not racism. We need to do something about that. Was I wrong when I talked about the importance of choice in school? I went to a school called Crenshaw High. You guys know that school. If you saw the movie Boys in the Hood, that's my school. Front page article, LA Times a few years ago, 3% of kids at my former high school can do math at grade level. Not a typo, 3%. And that's up from 2% the year before. Now, what parent is going to send her kid to a school where only 3% of the kids can do math at grade level if that parent has an option out? And by the way, the school is a crip school. The reason I know that is because Ice-T went there 10 years after I did and told me he chose it because he wanted to go to a crip school. So now you're living in that geographical area and you're assigned to a school where only 3% of the kids can do math at grade level and the school is a crip school. And you were forced to go there. One party, however, wants to give you options. One party believes in choice. And there's a program called the DC Hope Scholarship Program. Google it, check it out. The test scores have improved. More importantly, the dropout rate has significantly improved. And parental satisfaction is up. Less violence in the school. And what it does is give the parents an $8,000, $9,000 scholarship that the parent can use to go wherever uh, that kid can get in. So the, the uh, program is cheaper than the amount of money they're spending on public schools. Parents like it. And guess who wants to shut it down? You know, in 1997, Time Magazine and CNN polled black teenagers and white teenagers. And they asked them whether racism was a major problem in America. It's 23 years ago. Not too surprisingly, both said yes. More black kids said yes than white kids. But both of them, majority of them said yes. But then black kids were asked this question. Is racism a big problem, a small problem, or no problem in your own daily life? This is again 1997. 90% said no problem or small problem in my own daily life. In fact, more black kids than white kids said failure to take advantage of available opportunities is a bigger problem than racism. That's 23 years ago. That's before the election of Obama and re-election of Obama. Speaking of whom, when he was senator, he gave a speech at a historically black college. And he talked about the amount of racism in America. And he said the Moses generation, referring to the generation of MLK, has gotten us 90% of the way there. We have, his generation, he called it the Joshua generation, have an additional 10% to go. I thought that was a pretty fair reflection on how much racism there was. 10% to go. This is before he became president. Now fast forward, racism, institutional racism, systemic racism, structural racism, use your favorite term. How do we go from 90% of the way there to racism now is pernicious, which is what Eric Holder said. What happened? What happened is they are trying to make you think like victims, so you pull that lever 95% for one particular party. Hard work wins. 
Candace gave me 15 minutes, so I'm, I don't want to go over. <laughs> Quick story about my father. My father and I sat down when I was 25 years old and had a long talk. The talk I thought was going to last five or 10 minutes. We ended up talking for eight hours. My father and I did not have any meaningful conversation from the time I was 15 years old to 25. I had to work for him. I didn't like working for him. He yelled, he screamed, he was moody, he was grouchy. We really had a real problem. And when I was 15 years old, I walked out of the restaurant and my dad and I did not have a meaningful conversation for 10 years. Lived in the same house. Well, he didn't, he didn't abandon the family. I just ignored his butt. And now I can't sleep. I'm having difficulty sleeping. And I know it has something to do with my father. And I decided to talk to him about why I had such issues with him. So my dad and I sat down and I said, now, Larry, don't tee off on the man. Don't tell him about all the spankings he gave you, all the things he said. You don't do everything. So I sat down and teed off on him. You guys know how I can go. So for 10 minutes, I told him everything he'd ever done, every whipping, every spanking, everything he'd ever said to me. And after 20 minutes, I was out of ammo. And my dad looked at me and he said, is that it? <laughs> you didn't speak to me for 10 years because of that? And I said, yeah. He said, let me tell you about my father. This is the first time we ever had this conversation. I knew my dad was an only child and I knew his father wasn't around because I met his mother once and we never got any, any presents from anybody on his family side, so I knew my dad didn't have much of a family, but I didn't care, I didn't like him anyway. He said, your last name? Yeah, Elder, that's not my father's name. What's your father's name? I don't know, never met him. Who's Elder? Well, he was one of my mother's boyfriends. She had a bunch of boyfriends, each one more irresponsible than the other one. Uh, Elder was an alcoholic. Uh, and when he did work, he would bring the money home to his mom, to my, to my mother. And then when he'd want it on Wednesday, she wouldn't give it to him. He'd beat the crap out of her. If I stopped him, he'd beat the crap out of me. My mother, my dad said, could neither read nor write. I was born in the back of the house. I don't even know my birth date. I know the year, I don't know the date. My dad comes home at the age of 13, starts quarreling with his mom's then boyfriend. She sides with the boyfriend, throws my father out of the house, never to return. You're talking about a black boy born in 1915, Jim Crow South at the beginning of the Great Depression. Literally thrown out of the house at 13 years old, dropped out of school at eighth grade. I defy you to find somebody who had a hand dealt like that. I said, Dad, what did you do? For the next seven, eight hours, we're talking about his life. And he said, I went down the street, and I walked down the road. It wasn't the street. And I took anything I could get. Ultimately, my father became a Pullman porter on the trains. They were the largest private employer of blacks in those days. And so this little black boy was able to travel all around the world, the country, and he came to California once. And it was sunny. People seemed less racist. My dad said, maybe I'll move to California sometime. Pearl Harbor. My dad joined the Marines. I said, Dad, why the Marines? He said, two reasons. You know, you know what I'm going to say. Two reasons. What are they? Two reasons. They go where the action is, and I love those uniforms. <laughs> my dad was stationed on the island of Guam. He was staff sergeant. He was cook. My dad can look at a cake and tell you what's in it. So he goes back to Chattanooga, Tennessee, where he met and married my mom to get him a job as a short order cook, and he's told, we don't hire niggers. My dad said, I cook for the mill. We don't hire niggers. He went to an unemployment office. Lady says, you went through the wrong door. My dad goes outside, sees colored only, goes to that door to the very same lady who sent him out. My dad went back to my mom and said, this is BS, I'm going to California, get me a job as a short order cook. Come out to California, he walks around, I'm sorry, you have no references. My dad said, I cook, you have no references. My dad said, I'll cook for you for free for two weeks, just write me a reference if you think I've done a good job. Wouldn't even do that. He goes to unemployment office, this time just one door. And he says, what time do you open? She says, eight, what time do you close? Five, I'll be here at eight. I'll stay here until you find something. My dad sat in a chair for a day and a half. She calls him up, she said, I got something. I don't think you'll want it. My dad said, I'm sure I'm gonna want it. What is it? She says, it's cooking, it's uh, cleaning toilets and Nabisco brand bread. My dad took that job for 10 years cleaning toilets, took a second job with another bread company called Barbara Ann Bread Cleaning Toilets, cooked for a family on the weekend to get additional money, and went to night school two or three nights a week to get his GED. The man never slept, which is why he was grouchy all the time. <laughs> 15 minutes here, half hour here, hour of sleep here, and then you come home to a house with three rambunctious boys, what kind of mood are you gonna be in? So my dad got bigger and bigger and bigger, 
during this eight-hour conversation, and Larry got smaller and smaller and smaller. At the end, I'm crying. And I said, Dad, please forgive me for judging you so harshly. He said, there's nothing to forgive you didn't know, but follow the advice I've always given you and your brothers. Hard work wins. <clears throat> You get out of life what you put into it. Larry, you're not in control of the outcome, but you are 100% in control of the effort. And before you moan about what somebody did to you or said to you, go to the nearest mirror, look at it and say, what could I have done to change the outcome? And finally, no matter how good you are, how hard you work, sooner or later, bad things are going to happen. How you address those bad things will tell your mother and me if we raised a man. Final story about my mother. My mother was raised on a farm, uh, Huntsville, Alabama. So my mother was almost like royalty compared to my dad. Uh, she, I asked her, what was it like during the Great Depression? She said, what Great Depression? We grew our own stuff. We sold our surplus to people. We, it went right by us. Night and day, her, her, her life compared to my dad. And my mother always told my brothers and me, no one can make you feel inferior without your permission. We read a poem in class by a poet named County Cullen. And he goes like this, while riding through old Baltimore so small and full of glee, I saw a young Baltimorean keep a looking straight at me. Now I was young and very small and he was no whit bigger, and so I smiled. But he poked out his tongue and called me nigger. I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until September. Of all the things that happened there, that's all that I remember. Well, the teacher was pissed, the class was pissed, I was pissed, everybody was pissed. Teacher talked about how it's gonna permanently damage this guy's ego. He'll always think of himself as a second class citizen. He'll never forget this. It'll torture his psyche. I knew my mother was gonna have a different attitude. I didn't know what it was gonna be, but I knew it was gonna be different. So I come home, my mother's in the kitchen stirring a big pot of greens, frying some chicken, I'll never forget it. I said, mom, we read a poem in class. I wanna get your reaction to it. She said, go ahead. I said, it goes like this. While riding through old Baltimore, so small and full of glee, I saw a young Baltimorean keep a looking straight at me. Now, I was young and very small, and he was no whit bigger, and so I smiled. But he poked out his tongue and called me nigger. I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until September. Of all the things that happened there, that's all that I remember. My mom took the spoon out of the pot, hit it on the side, turned to me, and she said, Larry, what a darn shame he let something like that spoil his vacation. How many wings do you want? Thank you so much for having me. May God bless you. May God continue to bless the United States of America. I love you. I love you so much. If you'd like me to speak at your event, you know where to find me. I'm Larry Elder, and this has been The Larry Elder Show. See you next time. migrant men, at least one of whom was living in the United States illegally, have now been arrested in the illegal alien-friendly Montgomery County, Maryland, for allegedly raping two 11-year-old girls. Both men were enrolled in public schools as students. Both had come to the United States in the past several years from Central America, and both prove that our current immigration system, or rather the total ignoring of it, is about as useful as a poncho in a hurricane, and that hurricane could soon be coming to a school near you. Twenty-year-old Jonathan Correa Salamanca was enrolled as a high school student at Montgomery Blair High School in Silver Spring, Maryland, where he was arrested just two weeks ago for allegedly having a repeated sexual affair with an 11-year-old girl. Police say the victim's father found graphic, explicit text messages on a phone Correa Salamanca had secretly provided to his daughter, in which he described the encounters and gave her tips on how she could improve her sexual performance. She's 11. Now, in a separate incident, authorities also arrested 19-year-old Ivan Reyes Lopez on February 19th, also in Montgomery County, charging him with reportedly luring an 11-year-old girl from a park to his family's apartment in Silver Spring, where police say that he forcibly raped her. Now, Lopez did not deny the encounter, but he did tell police the incident between him and this child was consensual. Again, she's 11. 
ICE confirmed that Correa Salamanca is, in fact, in this country illegally, and he's been issued an immigration detainer. The report did not give Lopez's legal status, but he did say he had emigrated from Honduras three years ago and that he used a Spanish-speaking translator in court. Now, for those of us with brains, his recent arrival to the United States as a teen, as well as the fact that he was living with a family member at the time of his arrest in Montgomery County, suggests that he likely came to the United States as an unaccompanied minor. Now, a spokesperson for the Montgomery County School District, which is seated in a county known for being a sanctuary for illegal aliens, dismissed public concerns that these 19 and 20 year old men were enrolled as high school students, saying that, quote, there is no data suggesting that being a high school student at 19, 20 or 21 makes a person more or less likely to commit a crime and that any suggestion otherwise is wrong and trying to make a connection there to students enrolled in our district is wrong. Really? Is that so? Well, how about a connection to students who shouldn't even be in this country in the first place? How about a connection to grown men being enrolled in public schools with young teenagers all because they came to our country illegally and the left has bent over backwards to make sure that they can stay? Because see, apparently you can come here without following any legal process and enroll in public taxpayer funded schools. Nobody asks any questions or says a word about it. How about that connection? Are we allowed to talk about that? Because it's pretty easy to prove that there are people who would be alive today and little girls who would not have been raped if we did not let criminals just meander across our border and plop down in our classrooms with our kids or hop in a car and blow through signs they can't read or get their hands on a gun that they cannot legally possess and go on a shooting spree and kill a whole bunch of people. How about those connections? Can we talk about those? Because this is not a one-off thing, this is a pattern. This is the same one Montgomery County, Maryland, where an illegal alien was arrested just last year and charged with first-degree rape, sex abuse of a minor, and first-degree assault after allegedly raping a 16-year-old girl while holding her at knife point in her bedroom. Days later, another was arrested for sexually assaulting a woman in his car while she was drunk in 2018. Three illegal aliens with MS-13 beat a 15-year-old sex trafficking victim nearly to death with baseball bats because she wasn't doing a good enough job as a prostitute. All in Montgomery County, Maryland. So how about those connections? Can we talk about those? The problem with throwing out any notion of a legal immigration process means that we have no idea who's coming here. I don't know if Jorge is the nicest, smartest guy in all of Central America who just wants to get out of the barrio so he can study medicine, or if he's a violent gangbanger who likes to molest children and beat women. Without a legal immigration process, we have no chance of knowing because liberals have decided that our kids' lives are worth risking for political points, and the media will just ignore it when their bleeding heart system collapses and an 11-year-old girl suffers for it and then they'll snub Trump for inviting her family to the State of the Union. And this is why we keep talking about it here. Because whether they want to acknowledge it or not, these 11-year-old girls' lives matter. Your kids' lives matter. Immigrants and their children matter. The people still waiting to come here so they can give their kids a better life matter. And we owe it to every American and legal immigrant living in this country and to those waiting in line for that chance to make sure that our process protects them and their kids as much as we possibly can. And this one doesn't. And that's your reality check, America. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube page, that you like us on Facebook and Twitter, and stay sane out there. I got a question. Which is more disturbing, the coronavirus or Trump derangement syndrome? TDS has spread to Florida. Local and state Republican leaders spoke out about what they call a partisan attack on their volunteers at a voter registration drive this weekend. Gregory Tim has made national headlines after police say that 27 year old drove a van through a Duval County Republican Party's tent Saturday in the Sandalwood area. No, TDS is bad in Florida. Are they working on a vaccine? Robert Youngblood was in a Florida restaurant wearing his Make America Great Again hat when surveillance video shows a man walking behind Youngblood and put what he says was a balled up wet paper towel on the brim of his hat. 
and I hear him yelling and screaming at the top of his voice. Youngblood says he was attacked for wearing his MAGA hat, another example of politics coming to a boiling point in public. And it spread to California, whether it's Humboldt County, Winnetka, or Palo Alto. In this first clip, the arrested suspect is a Bernie Sanders supporter. New details tonight at 11, Humboldt Republican Party headquarters vandalized once again. Members at the local branch in Eureka walking up to their building yesterday only to find it defaced. The Humboldt County Republican Party showing up to their headquarters on 5th Street in Eureka finding this. We have damage up here to our actual main sign and the, ele the Republican elephant symbol there. Um, up here we have 45, I'm assuming they're talking about Trump, president equals lies, house of lies. So I'm here on the door, you owe this country for at least three years of terrorism with one R and treason. As for how they got up that high. They obviously used a ladder or something. Um, I kind of see some damage up on the roof, so they may have come from up above also. Again, just crossed out more of our items here in the, in the window. Crossed out uh, our candidate and that we support for Ward 1 for Eureka City Council, who, you know, isn't a Republican running as a declined state. The man has been arrested for an attack at a Hermosa Beach restaurant last month. Police say the victim was wearing a red hat with Russian writing, which translated to Make America Great Again. Officers say this man, David Delgado, confronted the victim in the bathroom and started punching him, then stole the hat and ran off. Police used security video to identify him and arrested Delgado at his home. A Facebook user called Parker Mankey wrote in detail about yelling and cursing at this man inside a Palo Alto Starbucks on Monday for wearing a red Make America Great Again hat. His name is Victor, and we talked to him about it today at a park near that same Starbucks. And this woman comes over and she says, is that, is that a Trump hat? I said, well, I think it is, yeah. And then she turned to the rest of the audience, the people in Starbucks, and said, hey, everybody come over here. Let's get this guy. He's a hater. I'm calling him out. He hates brown people. He's a Nazi. Victor tells us he eventually left the coffee shop, but not because he felt threatened. In the Facebook post, Mankey describes a very similar story to the one Victor tells, even responding to another user that she's going to protest outside Victor's work and, quote, make him feel as unsafe as he made every brown person he met today. New Hampshire. The teen was here at the Wyndham High School polling location. He was holding a sign in favor of President Trump and standing among the president's supporters when someone came out of the polling location and attacked him. The boy's father tells me for them, this is a First Amendment issue. This man, Patrick Bradley, is accused of going after a 15-year-old President Trump supporter. Now, is anyone encouraging this sort of thing? Let's make sure we show up wherever we have to show up. And if you see anybody from that cabinet in a restaurant, in a department store, at a gasoline station, you get out and you create a crowd. And you push back on them. And you tell them they're not welcome anymore, anywhere. Virginia. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders says she was kicked out of a Virginia restaurant because of her job. Sanders tweeted about it this morning. She says last night the owner of the Red Hen in Lexington politely asked her to leave, so she did. Sanders went on to write, quote, her actions say far more about her than about me. I always do my best to treat people, including those I disagree with, respectfully and will continue to do so. One of the restaurant's co-owners confirmed the story to the Washington Post. Many by now have heard that I was asked to leave a restaurant this weekend where I attempted to have dinner with my family. My husband and I politely left and went home. I was asked to leave because I work for President Trump. We are allowed to disagree, but we should be able to do so freely and without fear of harm. And this goes for all people regardless of politics. Some have chosen to push hate and vandalism against the restaurant that I was asked to leave from. A Hollywood actor publicly encouraged people to kidnap my children. And this weekend, a member of Congress called for people to push back and make clear to those serving their country in this administration that they are not welcome anywhere, anytime, for anything. This follows an incident last week when protesters confronted Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen at a Mexican restaurant. Didn't Maxine Waters say harass Trump cabinet members? Mitch McConnell is the Republican leader of the Senate. 
Senator Mitch McConnell had his dinner interrupted in a big way Friday night, and we got the video. McConnell and his wife were at a restaurant in Louisville when a guy came up and just started railing on him. Oh, yeah. Why don't you get out of here? Why don't you leave the country? Ditch Mitch! The crowd in the restaurant was split, and McConnell kept his cool. Aside from politics, you want to know why this thing really got heated? The angry customer walked up to Senator McConnell's table and threw his doggy bag out the door. No, apparently the harassment edict is not limited to just Trump cabinet members. Stephen Miller is one of Trump's top advisors. I'm so glad that many of my uh, people from the Jewish community are now speaking up about uh, Stephen Miller. Miller, I was born and raised Asking in Asking that apostates. he resign now, or at least be we, removed. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. He should be. Uh, this guy is, is really a cancer uh, on this country. Shout out to Stephen Miller! Stephen Miller is, um, was recently given a lot more power in, in the Department of Homeland Security um, to crack down on immigrants and refugees who are just trying to find a safe place to live. Um, and we do not support immigration policies that are racist, that are white supremacist, um, that are xenophobic and that are putting other human beings' lives in danger. ...person in charge of separating families. This evil man lives in this building and we want our neighbors to know that he is dangerous and we won't, let, we won't stand for it. Texas? And a man is under arrest after allegedly assaulting a teenager wearing a Make America Great Again hat. 30-year-old Kino Jimenez being held on a felony theft charge after video surfaced showing him in an altercation with a 16-year-old wearing a red MAGA hat inside a San Antonio Whataburger, then throwing a drink in his face before leaving with the hat. Donald Trump Jr. coming to the young man's defense, offering to send a new hat with the president's signature. New York City? I was walking on Canal. It was some sort of event, uh, and uh, I got jumped from wearing this hat. And I started cursing at me, you know, saying, you know, Trump hat, blah, blah, blah. And uh, basically, one kid took my head and bashed it against the scaffold and pole. It all happened within 10 seconds. I jumped out, across the street, and I called the cops. And this is my situation right now. New Jersey? Prosecutors say an 81-year-old man was assaulted inside a New Jersey supermarket over his Make America Great Again hat. Somerset County Prosecutor Michael Robertson says the man was at the shop right on Elizabeth Avenue. He says the man suffered minor injuries but declined medical attention at the scene. No arrests have been made. Officials are asking anyone with information to contact the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office or Franklin Township Police. And then there is the ex-NYPD detective who was celebrating his 50th birthday in Tennessee. Daniel Sprague was at the stage bar on Broadway, sporting gifts his wife gave him for his 50th birthday bash. People were just coming up to me and, you know, loving the little, uh, you know, wordplay on the hat and taking pictures and wishing me a happy birthday. The red cap with white letters reading, making 50 great again, was clearly too much for one woman at the bar. Now we talked to ex-NYPD Detective Sprague. What the hell happened, Daniel? Well, my wife took me down to uh, Nashville to celebrate my 50th, and she invited a bunch of my friends without me knowing and family. And then she gave me a nice shirt that had making uh, America great since 1970, a black shirt with American flag on it. And then she gave me a red hat that had making 50 great again. And I put it on, I walked out, and I was walking around town, and then I ran into all my friends. And then we were walking around eating and doing stuff and people looking at the hat, giving me thumbs up for it. You could see some people a little disgusted, but when they got closer and they saw that it was making 50 great, they'd wish me happy birthday. And that just happened all day. Mm -hmm. And in the bar, we're hanging out with everybody and talking and all that. And people, the same thing, coming up, you see the faces of the people that thought it was one thing and they were upset, but when they got closer, they read it and it was fine. And all of a sudden, I get pulled from the shoulder and I'm in a conversation with my wife and I'm talking to her, so I keep my face on her as I'm spinning because I just thought it was one of my friends like, hey, come here for a minute. And when I started turning my head, I just got cold cocked by this woman and she ripped the hat off my head and she's holding the hat, screaming, 
how dare you? How dare you? And it, the bouncers at the, the the security, not bouncers, the security at the place was phenomenal, top notch. They were there within a second, split it all up. But they took her out the front and they took me out the back. And when I my wife was calling the the police and we were like, you know, you hold her. We need her name and everything. They said she left already. So once she went out, she disappeared. So did the police come and take a report? Um, we waited a little while. I don't know if it was busy, so we just went in the morning, and mm-hmm. I made a report, and uh, I've been in contact with the detective handling it. They're uh, in contact with the bar in the process of getting the tapes to start you know, reviewing it and seeing if we can get a positive ID on the woman. Daniel Sprague, you said she cold cocked you. Was it like a, a she balled up her fist and punched you like like Vin Diesel? It, yeah, it was definitely a closed fist. And, wow. Uh, she gave me a really good gash where I probably should have gotten stitches, but I didn't go to get them. Um, but it, it either she had a ring on, or maybe you know she had something in her hands, like maybe the keys were sticking out or something. But the like the, there was just definitely there was weight to it. So either a She's very athletic and into, like, you know, like mixed martial arts or something mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. She, the punch was definitely a solid punch. Or she did have something in her hand making it much more of a solid punch where it was capable of either really tearing the skin up the way it did or she had something pointed out. Detective, I thought you, I bet you thought New York was tough. <laughs> Tennessee. Yeah, 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 you know. <laughs> Tennessee. <laughs> I, I, and I thought I was going to God's country. <laughs> wow. My parents met and married in Tennessee. I thought Tennessee men were tough. They don't need any such speech. These men are from Tennessee. But those Tennessee women are tougher. I'm Larry Elder, and we've got a country to save. I'll see you next time.